Okay, so I pulled the screen because I uh, heard the sound is a little bit loud in the previous podcast, but I'm going to leave it, uh, as I said, just so that each time you listen, uh, you're reminded of the choices we, we will face with global warming. Uh, easiest adaptation to global warming is to turn on the AC, but AC, air conditioners are right now uh, emitting HFCs, uh, which are very bad for uh, global warming. and uh, Replacements for HFCs are coming along, but countries like India are not uh, allowed, not expected to switch over completely till uh, 2035 or so, uh, and it's not clear. Uh, anyway, let's leave it there. So, hot temperature extremes over land, the, this is done in a good way as well. So, frequency and increase in intensity of extreme temperature event that occurred, event that occurred once in 10 years on average uh, in a climate without human influence and 50-year events. So historical record is looked at for 1850 to 1900. Uh, so obviously the baseline is once in a 10-year event or once in a 50-year event. And you can see the number of events that would have occurred over this period. And we have already had one degree C warming. So now it is likely to occur 2.8 times with a range of 1.8 to 3. Two. So to the extent that this warming is related to human activity, the human activity is already increased extreme heat events from once in 10 years to uh, 2.8 times. Uh, and this is expected to increase to 4.1 times if the warming is allowed to cross uh, 1.5 degrees C. If we hit one, a 2 degrees C, then it will likely occur 5.6 times with a larger uncertainty range going with it. At 4 degrees C warming, we're going to have 9.4 times more likely occurrence of extreme heat events. And you can see the intensity increase. Right now, uh, we are in the range of 1.2 uh, degrees C hotter. It's going to get 1.9 degrees C, uh, 2.6 C, degrees C, and 5.1 degrees C horror in terms of uh, extreme uh, intensity of extreme events. 50-year events will increase, uh, they have increased 4.8 times in the present 1 degree C uh, warming that has been observed, expected to increase to 8.6 times, 13.9 times and 39.2 times uh, with warming of 1.52 and 4 degree C and the intensity is expected to go uh, very high as well here crossing 5 degrees C for 4 degrees C global warming uh, future. So these are a nice way to look at basically we are comparing with the past and also we know that climate change is going to load the dice in, in the sense that events that would happen once in 50 years will begin to happen more often. So obviously uh, 50 year event is going to occur uh, more uh, likely to occur 4.8 times means you are just increasing these rare events. Similarly for heavy precipitation over land 10 year events 18 uh, we are again looking at frequency and intensity for 10 year and uh, event for heavy precipitation and agri uh, agricultural and ecological droughts. Uh, so uh, we have had a uh, uh, a likely in, uh, occurrence of 1.3 times, so more than once here, slight increase with 1.5 that is going to go to 1.5 degrees C warming future, it's going to go to 1.5 times uh, in terms of a likelihood of occurrence, increasing to 1.7 for 2 degrees C and 2.7 times for 4 degrees C with uh, intensities here 6.7% uh, uh, wetter. 10.5% uh, wetter, 14 and 30.2% wetter uh, with these warmings in terms of the intensity of the events. Agricultural and ecological droughts in drying regions, so keep that in mind. Uh, once per event, one, uh, one in 50 year events have gone to 1.7 times already because of this 1 degree C warming we've had will likely occur two times with 1.5 degrees C and 2.4 and 4.1 times respectively with 2 degrees C and 4 degrees C warmings. And here are the uh, standard deviations of uh, the uh, dryness uh, uh, in terms of intensity increase. You can see there is a large range here. So 0.3 plus uh, 0.3 standard, devi uh, standard deviation drier 
point five, point six, and one standard deviation dryer uh, with warming. So these are things to keep in mind. In terms of where the CO2 is going, the proportion of CO2 emissions taken up by land and ocean carbon sinks is smaller in scenarios with higher cumulative CO2 emissions, which is expected as you keep increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere, the ability of the sinks like land, ocean uh, is going to reduce, which means accumulation in the atmosphere is going to be faster. So far, the ocean is about taking about 26 percent, I think land is taking some 40 some percent, so the remaining uh, CO2 in the atmosphere is mostly responsible for the global warming with the uh, additional detail that a uh, lot of that energy is going into the ocean as well. So total cumulative CO2 emissions taken up by land and oceans and remaining in the atmosphere in gray here under five illustrative scenarios from 1850 to 2100. Cumulative CO2 which is what is responsible for the warming in a linear sense. So you can see that we started here and uh, in SSP 1 uh, 1.9, which is the most benign uh, scenario we can ever hope for. Uh, the atmosphere will keep some ocean and land take up quite a bit. Uh, with uh, SSP 1 2.6, which allows for more emissions because we are going to cross uh, 1.5 here. So land and ocean still take up 65%, uh, uh, but atmosphere now gets uh, the rest of it. So you can see that proportionate increase and as you go into uh, SSP 2 4.5, SSP 3 7, SSP 5 8.5 the accumulation in the atmosphere increases very rapidly and the relative amount taken by land and ocean begins to drop. This is not good news, right? Uh, as for global surface temperature change relative to 1850 to 1900, uh, here is where we have come uh, since the industrial, uh, since 1950, and here is where we will head depending on the scenarios, uh, ranging from the best scenario to the business as usual. And associated with that, you will have uh, ocean acidification, so you can see the drop in ocean pH, which is bad news for most of the biodiversity uh, in the corals ecosystems and for species that are calcifiers like coccolithophores and uh, forams and other uh, shell forming animals. Okay, So obviously business as usual would bring us crashing down to uh, some of the pH levels that haven't been seen for tens of millions of years. Uh, September Arctic ice. September Arctic ice <coughs> Boreal summer, uh, uh, end of boreal summer ice uh, determines how much it can grow back into the next year. So here is where we've been crashing historically since about the 19, late 1970s and the news is not good and even for the best scenarios of SSP 1, 2.6 and 1.9 uh, we will be way below uh, the uh, levels we started with in the 1950s but if we cross uh, beyond that, even the middle of the road SSP 2 4.5 will basically give us ice-free Arctic at some point and we have discussed elsewhere that uh, not all countries are bothered about this because there is a lot of fossil fuel buried in there that countries will likely fight for and already some jostling for position is happening but if we take out those fossil fuels and burn them then what happens? So obviously it's a uh, really endless loop. Global mean sea level change relative to 1900 again uh, same we have been increasing it we have increased it by about 20 centimeters in the global mean SSP 8.5 will take us very rapidly towards 2 meters by 2100 and the rest of them are down here uh, less than 1 meter but remember this is global mean there are some very vulnerable island states and countries like Bangladesh or states like Florida and New York which are going to have a huge price to pay. Looking at global mean sea level change in 2300, the longer term projection relative to uh, 1900. I'm not a big fan of this because the uncertainty is large as you can see, but nonetheless the IPCC report uh, provides this figure. So SSP 1 2.6 is down here in the range of uh, 3 meters. Maybe we should worry about this because this is a classical intergenerational uh, 
issue where we're going to leave them with a huge problem if we don't do something but uh, that's always a big question how capable are we about worrying about the future generation finally the multiple climate impact climatic impact drivers are projected to change in all regions and IPCC provides an interactive atlas that you can look at look at climatic impact drivers or CIDs are physical climate system conditions like means events and extremes that affect an element of society or ecosystems Depending on system tolerance, CIDs uh, and their changes can be detrimental, beneficial, neutral, or a mixture of each across interacting system elements and regions. The CIDs are grouped into seven types which are summarized under the icons in the figure. I won't go into the details. Uh, you can look at the table from the report. All regions are projected to experience changes in at least five uh, climatic impact drivers uh, for many sorry almost all 96 percent are projected to experience changes in at least 10 CIDs and half in at least 15 climate Im climatic impact drivers for many CIDs there is wide geographical variation uh, in where they change and so each region are uh, so each region is projected to experience a specific set of CID changes. Each bar in the chart represents a specific geographical set of changes that can be explored in Working Group 1 Interactive Atlas. So let's just look at the groupings. Number of land and coastal regions uh, in coastal regions and open ocean regions where climatic impact driver is projected to increase or decrease with high confidence so in the next slide there is the color shading dark shades are high confidence and uh, so that is high confidence of increase or decrease and light shades are medium confidence of increase and decrease so uh, the heat and cold events are looked at in terms of mean surface temperature, extreme heat, cold spell, frost, and then uh, under wet and dry, you have mean precipitation, river floods, heavy precipitation and pluvial floods, landslides, aridity, hydrological drought, agri agricultural and ecological drought, and uh, in wind, uh, also here is fire weather. Uh, in wind, we have mean, severe, tropical cyclone, sand and dust storms. Uh, snow and ice similarly other which includes uh, air pollution uh, weather atmospheric co2 at the surface radiation at the surface and coastal include relative sea level coastal flooding coastal erosion uh, marine heat waves ocean acidity and in the open ocean we look at mean ocean temperature marine heat waves ocean acidity uh, ocean salinity and dissolved oxygen which is obviously a huge habitat uh, disturbance so without trying to match so under each there these these things go under each of those so just look at various uh, places where the confidence is high and confidence is medium uh, so either increase or decrease of the corresponding cluster of events heat and cold wet and dry wind snow and ice other uh, for coastal and uh, open ocean so I won't go in as I said I won't go into the detail detail so regions with high confidence increase regions with medium confidence increase here regions with high confidence decrease and regions with medium confidence decrease uh, in the lighter shaded envelope legend is the height of the uh, lighter shade lighter shaded envelope behind each bar represents the maximum number of regions for which each climate impact driver is relevant the envelope is symmetrical about the x-axis showing the maximum possible number of relevant regions for CID increase uh, or decrease okay uh, these are assessed future changes uh, changes refer to a 20 to 30 year period centered around 2050 and or consistent with 2 degrees C global warming compared to a similar period within 1960 to 2014 or 1850 to 1900 so there are relative changes for a 20 to 30 year period in the future with respect to a past period of similar length okay so every ton of co2 emission adds uh, to global maybe i should do this in the next podcast because this may require uh, a little bit more discussion so let me stop this here and come back to uh, another podcast okay